Shema's prayers for mercy. So all of us are mercy cases. We all need the mercy very much. So in the prayers of Brahma, we will find out what is the mercy and how to get the mercy and what we must do in our devotional lives, was which attitude we must have so that we will be recipients of mercy. So in the Bhagavatam, King Yudhisthira inquired from Krishna, how is it the devotees of Lord Shiva, they become so rich, and the devotees of Lord Vishnu are poor? And Lord Krishna answered, if I especially favor a devotee and wish to care for him, the first thing I do is take away his riches. And so when, when a devotee loses everything, then his family doesn't care for him anymore. And so the devotee becomes doubly unhappy. But Prabhupada says that when a devotee has difficulties and miserable condition, it's not due to past karma. It is actually Krishna's mercy. And when he becomes rich, it is also Krishna's mercy. So in either case, the devotee is trying to become completely dependent on Krishna. So in the Krishna book, Prabhupada says, my devotee is not deterred by any adverse conditions of life, so I give myself to him. So if we are <coughs> accepting whatever happens to us as Krishna's mercy, then we will gain Krishna in exchange. So now you can, I have given you this chart, and, and the first thing is, what is Krishna's mercy? And there is a verse in Bhagavatam, right after this verse about, um, it, Krishna says, if I am very merciful, I take everything away. And then it describes the <coughs> characteristics of mercy. Uh, actually, the verse is there, and in our Bhagavatam, it's not translated according to this, but it's from Krishna book. So I took Prabhupada's original translation from Krishna book to give you this breakdown here of the verse. 10.88.10 actually is the verse um, in Bhagavatam. And the first word is Brahma, that this mercy can be only compared to all pervasive Brahman. It's such a great mercy that we cannot understand it. It's unlimited. It's expanding. It's unlimitedly expanding and great. So imagine that you get some mercy today and tomorrow it expands. And the next day it expands and it keeps expanding. So that is the nature of mercy, Brahma. Uh, so then the next word we have here is paramam. Paramam means it is spiritual. There's no comparison in this material world because Krishna gives himself. There was one story, I read a true story from Indijuna Maharaj that he had one, I think it was your country of, no, it was in Kazakhstan, it was another one of those country, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, yeah. From that country in the Eastern Bloc, uh, used to be Soviet Union, Azerbaijan, yeah. So one man there, he was uh, from the Muslim faith, and uh, he, but then he met the devotees, and he was, he was a very, he was quite a well-to-do businessman. And uh, he met the devotees, and he decided to visit Vrindavan, and when he was in front of the deities, he prayed to Radharani that, please remove all obstructions to my progress in spiritual life. A very dangerous prayer to pray. And Vrindavan, so lo and behold, as soon as he got back, his business failed. Of course, he asked for it. It's not like Krishna does that for everyone. And uh, then, later on, Indudumaraj met him, and, and he asked the man, so how is everything, he said. And he told him what happened. He said, yes, my business failed. So Maharaj said, so what are you doing now? He said, well, I started a smaller business, which is enough for me. 
And now I increased, now I'm chanting 32 rounds a day. He said, and my realization was when I was worshiping Allah, then Allah was giving me a lot of material opulence. And then I worshiped Krishna, I lost everything, but I got Krishna's lotus feet. Of course, it's not just if you worship Allah, but if you worship in India, they also worship a lot of demigods for material opulence. But they're afraid to worship Krishna because they think they will lose everything uh, in, in, some of the, in some of the parts, I think Tamil Nadu, they're, they, they're afraid to worship Krishna because they, and especially they say, okay, you can worship Krishna, but don't put the flute in his hand. Because if you hear the flute, you might lose everything and forget everything. And so, yeah, it's, uh, Krishna has a reputation <laughs> for, for this. <laughs> but actually, he gives himself, and so the mercy that he gives is unlimited, it's expanding, it's paramam, it's shukshma, very fine. What does suksha mean? Uh, the devotee, he's tested, and when he's tested, then he can experience Krishna's love for him. Then the love comes out. We feel the exchange of love. The suksha means the very finest quality of love between Krishna and his devotees. So shukshma, then chin matram, completely spiritual. Uh, Maksha means absolute spirituality with no tinge of material qualities. And Sat, eternal, and Ananta come, unlimited. So a devotee of Krishna doesn't worship the demigods. He, complete, he just surrenders to Krishna, and Krishna gives him unlimited mercy. So that's something we can expect. I have a little thing to share with you from Niranjan Swami. He said about mercy. He says that um, I have no right to get the Lord's mercy. I have no right even to ask the Lord for his mercy. Why should he even listen to me? Who am I? I've not bound him in the core of my heart. I've not served him in any way that would be pleasing to him. I don't desperately call out to him like a child calling for his mother. I don't remember him in happiness and distress. In fact, I don't remember him in any condition of life. Well, this is Maharaj, his humbleness. His humility. I haven't surrendered my life to him. In fact, I haven't surrendered anything at all to him. And worst of all is I have ab absolutely no love for him. Why should he give me a drop of his mercy? So Maharaj is it showing us the attitude of someone who is actually qualified to get the mercy. So we may not be qualified, but even it comes, just like I was discussing Prahlad Maharaj, that the Lord is especially merciful to the, the new devotees who are just now struggling with the material modes of nature. So Brahma is now seeing the Lord face to face and he's praying for mercy. And why does he want mercy? Because he wants to create. He wants to create the universe, which is a big job, a big service for Krishna. Uh, so not only creation, but he wants to preach because he's the head of the Madhva, Brahma Madhva Sampradaya. So the reason why he wants to create is so that he can give a chance for everyone to go back to God. So it includes preaching because that's the purpose of creation. So what kind of mercy, so we all want mercy. What kind of mercy should we pray for? So this is a question to you. Do you have any ideas? What kind of mercy? If we're going to pray for mercy, what kind of mercy should, that is safe? <laughs> um, what is it? A good prayer. What kind of mercy could we pray for? Yeah? Well, like, uh, please, please, friend, uh, let, let me stick with this process. Oh, let me stick with the process. That's a good one. Okay, you had your hand also? Pray for the pure love of God, but at the same time, there might be the true interference of that and some attachment to the matter. So maybe that uh, <laughs> uh, that's like once in, in the spiritual life. Okay. Pray for advancement.
advancement, spiritual life. Yeah, the advancement and, and at the same yeah. time the, you know, the family yeah. experience and all that. Yeah, family, take care of the family. And so that, yes, because many of us are living in this, most of us are living in this world. And we have to act in the world. So pray for advancement in spiritual life. Yeah. Pray for intelligence to preach better. Pray for intelligence. Intelligence to preach. So good. Now we have from the brahmacharis and the grihastas. <laughs> we have our different prayers. Yes. Pray for the intelligence to preach. Yes. This is what we need. We need this mercy. We need to advance. We need to preach. We need intelligence to preach. So Rama is praying for empowerment to create. So we can all pray for that, whether you're grihasta or Ramacharya, everybody needs empowerment to do whatever you're doing. You can't do it by yourself. So now I'm going to read the first verse. You don't have this verse. You will join me from verse 5. So I will just um, say the first four verses one by one uh, so that you don't miss anything. The first verse, Brahma says, Oh my Lord, today after many, many years of penance, I've come to know about you. How unfortunate the embodied living entities are that they are unable to know your personality. My Lord, you are the only knowable object because there is nothing beyond you. If, it is some, if there is something supposedly superior to you, it is not the absolute. You exist as the supreme by exhibiting creative energy of matter. So Brahma, he's grateful for his good fortune and that we should have this gratefulness that uh, Every day, we're able to associate with devotees, able to see the deities, able to come to the temple. This is wonderful fortune. But at the same time, he's worried about us, Lord Brahma. He's concerned for the conditioned souls, for us. Uh, so, Sri Prabhupada explains that one can know the cause, the Lord, by the causeless mercy of the Lord, which is bestowed upon the Lord's pure devotees like Brahma and those in his specific succession. So how did Brahma, how was he able to see Vishnu? Uh, because uh, he did penance and austerity. So what is what penance do we do? Well, we follow the four regular principles and we try to chant our 16 rounds faithfully without offense. This is our penance. Hmm. So, the mercy is coming to us through Srila Prabhupada. Somehow or other we came in contact with Srila Prabhupada. And we have his books and we have his devotees, we have his instructions. And if we can follow that, then we'll get the mercy. So then verse 2, Brahma says, The form which I see is eternally free from material contamination and has invented to show mercy to the devotees as a manifestation of internal potency. This incarnation is the origin of many in other incarnations, and I am born from the lotus flower grown from your navel. So Brahma is describing who he's seeing. Which incarnation is Brahma seeing right now, according to this description here? Which name? What's his name? Mm -hmm. Good. Gavodakshai Vishnu, but from his navel comes Brahma, the second expansion of Vishnu. So verse 3, Brahma is going to describe the qualities of the Lord that attract him. Uh, my Lord, I don't see a su form superior to this form of eternal bliss and knowledge. In your impersonal Brahman of Fulgens, there is no change and no deterioration. I surrender to you because whereas I'm proud of my material body and senses, your Lordship is the cause of the classic manifestation, yet you are untouched by matter. So you look on your chart, you have the characteristics of the Lord, verse 3, which uh, attract Brahma to him. Lata Param, nothing is beyond his personality. Ananda Matram, he's a reservoir of pleasure. Vishashijam, creator of the universe. Visham Atman, soul of everything. Tau Upashito, me, I surrender to you. So these things, because he's the creator, so he's he is attracted to Lord as Vishashisham, as the creator of the universe. But he's also attracted to Anandamatram, reservoir of pleasure. 
So there is a beautiful verse in 10th Canto, 14th chapter, verse 7, prayers of Brahma, after he stole the coward boys and cats. He said, in time, learned philosophers and scientists might be able to count all the atoms of the earth, the particles of snow, or even the shining molecules radiating from the sun, the stars. But among those learned men, who can count the unlimited transcendental qualities possessed by you, Supreme Lord. So Sanatana Goswami, I, I quoted this in a previous class one morning here, and he explains that the Lord manifests a specific spiritual quality for the benefit of each and every living entity. Actually, I didn't quote it in class, it was at the ladies' class. So now you get the benefit of that quote. For each and every individual entity, there is a quality which attracts us to him. Each and every one of us, there's a quality of Krishna that will attract us to him. So isn't that nice? He gets us. <coughs> he attracts us in our, in our own individual way. And there's unlimited living entities, so how many qualities must the Lord have? Unlimited. You cannot count them. So now my question to you, this is a seminar, so it's more interactive. It's not a class. What quality of the Lord are you attracted by? You can think. What what quality of the Lord, and it can be any Lord, Krishna, Chaitanya, Jagannath, Ram. What quality attracts you personally? If you were to think of all the qualities of the Lord. Yes? He's always surpri surprising. He's always surprising. Yes, never a dull moment. It's an adventure to be with him. Never a dull moment. He won't be bored. Okay, any other quality of the Lord? Yes? Um, I've always been struck by this verse from Sikhan Saitanta, this Vandeshi Kishpurta. Vandeshi Kishpurta. Oh, wonderful verse. Good. So Gornitai have risen in, in like the sun and moon, and not only are they the sun and moon simultaneously rising, they are rising in our heart. And they take care of the darkness of our innermost core of our heart. That's a beautiful quality. The Lord in the heart, uh, Gornitai in the heart, are rising. Not only and spreading like the sun and moon all over the world and also all over our hearts. Good. Any other quality of Krishna? that attracts you, or Gornitai, or anyone, any incarnation. Mm -hmm. well, simple but beautiful. <laughs> simple but beautiful. Yeah, I'm attracted to the beauty of Govinda. Yes? Uh, this, uh, uh, caring, kindness. Caring, okay, compassion and caring, very good, yes. Bhakta Vatsala, his devotee is very dear to, to him. And so he's very caring for his devotees. Good. So we'll go on any more? Yes? Playfulness. Playfulness. Okay. Yes, when you go to the spiritual world, it's all play and no work. Here it's all work and no play, hardly. But in the spiritual world, it's all play and no work. <laughs> Yay. Are you all ready to go? <laughs> Tomorrow's class will, no, not tomorrow, Sunday's morning's class will be about going back to Godhead. And so you can stay tuned. Um, so verse four, this present form or any transcendental form of Krishna is equally auspicious for all the universes. Since you manifested this eternal personal form upon your, whom your devotees meditate, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Those who are destined to be dispatched to the path of hell neglect your personal form because of speculating on material topics. Oh, so, who are these persons who are destined to be sent to hell? Prabhupada explains, persons who are addicted to the impersonal form of the Lord, whether in meditation or otherwise, are pilgrims to hell. 
because they waste their time in mundane mental speculation and false arguments. And so don't be a pilgrim to hell, but go back to God did. Think of the personal form of the Lord, and this will be very helpful. So now in verse 5, you do have this verse. We will sing, I'll sing one line, and you can repeat after me. Ye tu twa di o charanam buja ko shagan tam. Ye tu twa di o charanam buja ko shagan tam. Chi kranti karna ni varai shuti vata ni tam. Chi kranti karna ni varai shuti vata ni tam. Bhaktiya grihi ta charana karaya chate sham. Bhaktiya grihi ta charana. So I would like to mention at this point, this is Canto 3, Chapter 9, Verse 5. So we are studying the prayers of Brahma from Canto 3, Chapter 9. Today we'll go from verses 1 to 14. And tomorrow we'll finish the rest in chapter 9. So the translation of 395. Oh my Lord, persons who smell the aroma of your lotus feet, carried by the air of Vedic sound through the holes of the ears, accept your devotional service. For them you are never separated from the lotus of their hearts. So has anyone had the experience of smelling through the ears. <laughs> That's what this verse says. You can smell through your ears. You know what that means? Your ears are spiritual when you can smell through your ears because in our spiritual senses, then everything, our senses are interchangeable. We can smell through the ears. So if you can smell, what are you going to smell? The lotus feet of Krishna carry through the air of sound. Now, my question to you is, how do Krishna's lotus feet smell? What do they smell like? If you're going to smell them through your ears, what is, what is, what is the aroma? Yeah. Tulsi. Tulsi, very good. So anything else? Anything else they smell like? Tulsi. Think of, yeah. It must be something wonderful. Sandalwood is, is usually uh, is there also. Anything else? Think of what we call his feet. Oh, lotus. They must smell like lotus. <laughs> yeah. They must smell like lotus also. And sandalwood and tulsi. Uh, yes, all these wonderful things. And you can smell them through your ears. How can you smell through your ears? Because sometimes you hear about something that smells good, and, and even though you don't smell it through your nose, you remember the smell, and it comes. So, yes, this one day we will smell Krishna's lotus feet through our ears. The day will come. So, this is Prophet's mercy that we can smell Krishna's lotus feet through our ears. Sometimes we hear about seeing the Lord through our ears too. That will also come. So the ears are so wonderful for spiritual life. You can hear with them, you can see, and you can smell with them oh, also. <laughs> also the ears. The Lord Bhagavatam enters through our ears and comes and sits on the lotus of our heart. And so, Robert says in the parapod, for the pure devotee, there is nothing beyond the lotus seat of the Lord. And the Lord knows such devotees do not wish anything more in fact, the Lord doesn't want to be separated from the lotus hearts of the pure devotees. So Prabhupada, he had Krishna's lotus feet in his heart, so he could give Krishna to us. He was so attractive to everyone. So now, again, questions. You will not sleep in this seminar for sure. Um, what qualities of Prabhupada are you attracted by that make you want to surrender to him? Yes? 
Innocent playfulness. Yeah, he's very innocent. Yeah. And uh, his, uh, well, his, you could say his mercy, that he, he, the care that he had for, for mm -hmm. us. For Good. The care he had for us. Good. Yes. He was bold and fearless. Bold. And bold and fearless. Yes. Yes, he was bold and fearless. For those who are preachers, you need to be bold and fearless. And even if you're not preachers, you have to be bold and fearless to be a devotee in this world. It's not easy. The tide is against us. And so, yes, it's very important. Any other qualities of Srila Prabhupada that attract you to him? Yes? That he accepted all, no matter he didn't look the outside. He just looked yeah, outside. he accepted everyone. He didn't judge. He was not, not judgmental. He saw the spiritual spark in us and he tried to fan that spark. He didn't see the bad. Good. And this, any other qualities of Srila Prabhupada? Yeah. Um, in Vrindavan, I was once staying in Parashrama. I don't remember whether it was Mahadevi mm -hmm. Swami or Dina Bhagavad Gita. But they said that Prabhupada sees. His heart was like molten and gold. And mm -hmm. Like yes. whatever there was from Krishna, it was all, and like feelings, everything was coming very purely, and, and also it was like very sympathetic. That it was immediate when, when Krishna was there, immediately there was movement in the heart. Good. So Krishna, Prabhupada's heart was like molten gold, and the feelings were there. And we could experience that in his presence. Okay, so now we're going to have some homework for tomorrow. Nothing to write, but something to pray for. Um, so our homework is, how is Krishna's mercy coming to me? So that you need to look for tomorrow. How is the mercy coming? And so let us get some ideas. Uh, what to look for. How to look for mercy. Anybody have some idea? What kind of mercy are you already getting from Krishna? Yeah? Service. Service, okay. Yeah? I'm still here. You're still, I'm still here. You're still here. Uh, yeah, me too, yeah. after 46 years. Yeah. Association of devotees. Association of devotees, yes. That is the mercy. That is the highest mercy, actually. Without association of devotees, then it's very difficult to live in this world. Very difficult. So. Now the next uh, five verses I will also read until we get to verse 11. We'll join together again. Now the next verses, they describe the fate of the materialistic people who cannot see the Lord. This is uh, why he's feeling so much, uh, so much compassion. Verse 6, my Lord, the people of the world are embarrassed by all material anxieties. They are always afraid. They always try to protect wealth, body, and friends. They are filled with lamentation, unlawful desires, and paraphernalia, and they avariciously base their undertakings on the perishable conceptions of my and mine. As long as they do not take shelter of your safe lotus feet, they are full of such anxieties. So, in the purport, it's quite interesting that Prabhupada although the verse talks about anxieties and how everybody in this world is full of anxieties, in the purport, Prabhupada tells how to be free of anxiety. How, how does a devotee, how can a devotee be free of anxiety while living in this world? So this is what Prabhupada says. A pure devotee never thinks himself the proprietor of his home. He surrenders everything to the supreme control of the Lord, thus he has no fear for maintaining his family or protecting the interests of his family. Because of this surrender, he no longer has attraction for wealth. Even if there is attraction for wealth, it is not for sense enjoyment, for service, but for service of the Lord. So devotees might want some money, but it's for to use in the service of the Lord. Just like Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he was the head of a huge family. He had 10 or 12 children. And what was his mentality? What was his attitude? He expressed in his prayers that, oh my Lord, that you have 
given me so many servants of Krishna to serve. And I, I, my service is to maintain these servants of yours. So that's how he, he was in his Grihastha life. He was, <laughs> and he had a lot of servants to maintain. He had 10 or 12 children and his wife and, and uh, yeah, probably extended family members. So he was very responsible for Grihastha. Verse 7, O oh my Lord, persons bereft of the all-auspicious performance of chanting and hearing about your transcendental activities are certainly unfortunate and also bereft of good sense. They engage in inauspicious activities, enjoying sense gratification for a very little while. Now in the Sanskrit, it says kama, sukha, lesha, lavaya. How much time do people enjoy sense gratification? Lava. How long is a lava? It's about eight forty-fifths of a second, or about one-sixth of a second. For that enjoyment, people are working so hard in this world, uh, day and night. So, but if we take that fraction of a second and we associate with devotees, then we get perfection. So, again, compassion for the fallen souls. Um, that they don't chant and hear. Yamaraj says, bring all those people who are not chanting and hearing, who are not doing devotional service. Verse 8, all these poor creatures are constantly perplexed. This is 398 for those online and who have just joined us. I am told people are coming and going in these online streams for the whole time. So for the newcomers, Bhagavatam 398. Oh, great actor, all these poor creatures are constantly perplexed by hunger, thirst, severe cold, secretion, and bile, attacked by coughing winter, blasting summer, rains, and many other disturbing elements, overwhelmed by strong sex urges and indefatigable anger. I take pity on them, and I'm very much aggrieved with them. So we have a list here. Anybody experience any of these things or all of the above? Coughing winter, uh, you, have a, you have a cold winter here, I think, yes, in Finland. And, and dark winter, isn't it? There's not much light here. So it could be described as a coughing winter or a dark winter. Does the sun come up in, in the winter here? Well, in Helsinki, you need more than five hours. Oh, you do have five hours. Yeah. Oh, that's in not. North, no. In the north, it doesn't come up. It's, it sets in October and rises in February or something like that. <laughs> yeah, don't want to live up north, no. Um, there was, <laughs> I heard, I think it was uh, our, our, our friend Tapas Prabhu who was out in the north, they were up in the north on traveling Sankirtan, and he sent a message down, can you send us some potatoes? And the Rodi said, oh, they sound like their mind is not okay. And they sent a message, just come down right away. Because <laughs> <laughs> after you stay in the dark forever, it, it's, it might affect your, your brain somewhat. Um, and so, yeah, we get affected too. So this is, these are the miseries of this world. Coughing winter, blasting summer. In Vrindavan, it's 50 degrees, in 45 to 50. Yeah, so that could be called a blasting summer. Rains, now in Vrindavan, it's, it's a flooding. There's, and I saw the forecast, supposed to be rain every day. Monsoon has come early. And so it's, I saw a picture of our Goshal, it's flooded with water. And so this, these things are happening. And, uh, but most people, they watch the news and they don't think anything. But Brahma, he's feeling pity. He's feeling compassion. I'm a grief for them. So he says, I'm, he has feelings here. So verses 9 and 10, oh my Lord, the material miseries, 399 and 3910. The material miseries are without factual existence for the soul. Yet as long as the conditioned soul sees the body is meant for sense enjoyment, he cannot get out of the entanglement of material miseries being influenced by external energy. Such non-devotees engage their senses in very troublesome and extensive work, and they suffer insomnia at night 
because their intelligence constantly breaks their sleep with various mental speculations. They are frustrated in all their various plans by supernatural power. Even great sages, if they are against your transcendental topics, must rotate in this material world. So people, not only they work hard the whole day, then they can't sleep at night because they're in so much anxiety. And I heard that, um, and um, if you go to a hotel in America, in New York, they put sleeping pills next to your bedside because nobody can do without the sleeping pills. They can't sleep without pills. So this is the status in these expensive hotels. You, you, you have so much money, but you can't sleep at night. Better not to have so much money and get a good sleep. Uh, there was one man in Prabhupada met in Delhi, and he said to Shri Prabhupada, uh, I have a factory in Jaipur, I have a factory in Delhi, I have a factory here, a factory there, but I cannot sleep at night. I have so much anxiety. Prabhupada said, okay, give your factories to us. I will solve your problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> We, we will solve your problem, your anxiety problem. <laughs> so the man said, no, no, Swamiji, it's okay. <laughs> Prabhupada said, get his address. <laughs> said, no, Swamiji, I, I will come to you. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, no, but we should also be able to come to you. <laughs> and he had to give his address. <laughs> and the Prabhupada said, yes, we will take care of your anxiety for you. <laughs> So now we come to, well, actually, before we come to 11, um, anybody here ever work in a factory? They say that factories are very bad. Yes? Was it difficult? Huh? How, what kind of factory? Paper factory. Oh, paper factory. And you also? Yeah, I've been studying also, young summer job at Nokia. <laughs> Nokia? <laughs> Making phones? Yeah. And you have you also? Yeah. Many times. So, well, it seems very uh, natural for people in Finland to work in factories. Well, it's, it's a good fortune, actually, because as a summer job, you get some money. And, 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 uh, as a summer job? Because it's not so easy to get those places. Oh, I see. It's not fun. so easy to get such a mm -hmm. wonderful job <laughs> in the factory. <laughs> yeah. But generally, yeah, my, my um, son worked in a factory also. But he only lasted two weeks. Yeah, he was moving five tons of paper by machine, but the last five feet he had to do it manually. Tons of paper, five tons or something like that, crazy. And his feet were bleeding because he had these factory shoes on. They didn't really fit him. And he had to walk so many kilometers every day, or miles, whatever. But, uh, yeah, and they wanted him to work two shifts, 12, uh, 16 hours, he, he refused. And they wanted him to work seven days a week, he refused. And so they fired him, <laughs> like slave labor. You know. This was in the USA. So one of my godbrothers, Bajahari, he was working in a steel factory. And maybe I told you this in a class already. And he, he um, yeah, I think I told you that he was working and he always had a nervous breakdown. And Shida probably said, yes, because in your last life you were all Brahmins. Otherwise, how could you come so quickly to Krishna consciousness? So yeah, it, it's, it is not natural to work in factories. Prabhupada said in one purpose, a factory is another name for hell. So yes, maybe in Finland it's not so bad, but uh, in other countries, I, w I can't even repeat the stories that are happening in some of the factories. They're really, really bad. So now we will go together to verse 3, 9, 11. And I will sing one line you can repeat after me. Tvam bhakti yoga parivavita grit saroja bhakti yoga parivavita grit saroja Ase shite shita pato nanuna 
My Lord, your devotees can see you through the ears by the process of bona fide hearing. And thus our hearts become cleansed and you take your seat there. You are so merciful to your devotees that you manifest yourself in the particular eternal form of transcendence in which they always think of you. So the Lord is already in our hearts, so what does it mean he takes his seat in our heart? Uh, it means that he comes in a particular form that we are attached to. It's not that he, he is there forever for the non-devotees as super so as for a Vishnu. And he's neutral and he just gives the results. He's a witness and he gives them their karma, what they deserve. But for the devotees who are attached to a particular form, like Gornitai, he will come in that form. That super so may be Gornitai in your heart, it may be Radha Krishna in your heart. Maybe Sitaram, like Hanuman, he had Sitaram in his heart. So according to the particular deity that you're attached to, then you will get the Lord in your heart. He will be your super soul, your Ishtadev. So Prabhupada says, this means the Lord becomes subordinate to desire of the devotee, so much so that he manifests his particular form as the devotee demands. So that's the purport this 11th verse. So the ears, now we can see through the ears in this verse. And Prabhupada tells about how we have to become attached to the Lord. And how do you get this uh, attachment? In paragraph two, uh, in the middle, Prabhupada says, this particular attachment is invoked by practice of regulative devotional service to the Lord. Thus the devotee becomes attached to the eternal form of the Lord, just like one who is already eternally attached. So he sits on the lotus of our hearts. He does not leave us when we become attached to him. When we become attached to him, then he becomes attached to us. So as I said, the Bhagavatam, the sound incarnation also comes in the heart through the ears, sits on the lotus flower of his loving relationship. This is 285. And he cleanses the dust of material association like lust, anger, and anger. So in that purport, Prabhupada says, that it is said a single pure devotee can deliver all the fallen souls of the world. So one who's in the confidence of a pure devotee like Narada or Shukadev and is empowered by one's spiritual master can not only deliver himself from the clutches of Maya, but he can deliver the whole world. So if we simply follow Prabhupada's instructions, we can get empowered to deliver the whole world. Isn't that nice? So, power of the pure devotee. Now, we go to the next three verses again. You do not have them, 12 to 14, so I will summarize them for you. Verse 12, 3, 9, 12. My Lord, you are not satisfied by the worship of demigods. So yes, you can check your chart for what's going on. Different categories of living entities and how Krishna deals with them. So 12 talks about demigods and non-devotees. You are not satisfied so much by worship of demigods who are worshiping you very opulently, but who are full of material hankerings. You are in everyone's heart a super soul just to show your causeless mercy. And you are the eternal well-wisher, but you're unavailable for the non-devotee. Now, there are two types of devotees. The Sakam, devotee who has material desires, so like the demigods, and the Nishkam, that is the preachers. So the Lord is more pleased with the preachers because they take the responsibility to deliver the non-devotees. 
for the non devotees, he is not, he is unavailable. So that it is through the devotees that the Lord becomes available to the non devotees. Because here the verse says he's unavailable. So then how can somebody become a devotee if he's not available? We were all non devotees before, through the devotee. By the mercy of the devotee, then even the non devotees can reach the Lord. So what is the difference between Sakam and Nishkam? So the Sakam devotees have material desires mixed with desire for devotional service. But the Nishkam, they don't have a desire, they're not selfish. The demigods are selfish. And the Nishkam, the pure devotees are not selfish. The Sakam devotees, when they get, they always are praying for themselves something. Uh, if you see the prayers in Bhagavatam and the demigods get in trouble, they give little hints to the Lord, you know, when the demons are giving them trouble in, to the demigods. They said, okay, you saved the world as Varaha, you, you helped, you came as the Shingadev. Now we're in trouble. We are your devotees, so you should also save us. So, they, I mean, they're kind of like, if you read the prayers in Bhagavatam by the demigods, they do have, but, but they also, you know, they pray for help in their service. So Brahma, he's, he's a pure devotee and he's a demigod, but he's not an ordinary demigod. He's the head of the Brahma Sampadaya. And so he's feeling compassion of a preacher. So pure devotees, they take the missionary responsibility of turning non-devotees into devotees so they can satisfy the Lord more than the demigods, just like Yamaraj. He's in the near the hellish planets, and he, he's, he has a big management job. He manages all the sinful people. And, and because he was fried with management, he came as Vidura to preach. He came, when, when Krishna came here, he came down it because he, he was so much in the management. He never had time to preach, so he came down as Vidura. And he was protecting the Pandavas, who were Krishna's devotees. So, Prabhupada said, the Lord is unmindful of the non-devotees, though he's sitting in everyone's heart as super so, but he gives them the chance to receive his mercy through his pure devotees. So how, how is there's a comparison between the worship of the demigods and that of the pure devotees? We can see that if you read Krishna Lila in Vrindavan, at night Krishna would come home from the cow herding pastures with his cows and cowherd boys. And he would get delayed on the path at night by the demigods offering prayers. And he, he wasn't he wasn't very uh, interested. He was impatient to get home to be with his parents and with his gopis. So that is and in Vrindavan they say evening Sandhya Arti, Krishna is coming. The demigods are coming for the Sandhya Arti to see Krishna and offer prayers in Vedavan. So Prabhupada is an example, of course, of a Nishkan devotee. And I'll give you one story about Prabhupada and how he was compassionate to one very insignificant living entity. This was a story from Govindadasi. And Prabhupada was in one, uh, he was recuperating from his stroke. He was living in a house on the beach and there was, there was beautiful roses, and there was a garden there. He was sitting in the garden. And he was chanting, and she was sitting down on the ground beside him. And all of a sudden, she said, Ew, look at this. She saw a slug. Do you know what is a slug? Do you have those in Finland? Slug, yes, you know, or no? Gardening people, he, tell him, he, he, he says he knows. What is a slug? You can say in Finnish language? Soma. Soma? No. no. It's a very slimy... Uh. Yeah? It's like brown and it's kind of, it's just like a long yeah. line. I mean, past this. Yeah, maybe. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't look so closely to them. I have seen them though, Germany. And now is the time. They eat the leaves, no? They go on the leaves, big leaves. Yeah, so she saw one slug and she said, oh. 
so Prabhupada said, oh, what is it? And Prabhupada saw the slogan. He was full of compassion and full of love. And he said, chant to the poor creature. So she was chanting Hare Krishna to the slimy but benedicted slug, she said, until he went away. He had, so Prabhupada had so much compassion even for the most abominable creature. She said, I can never forget the sound of your voice when you gave me that instruction. In your instruction, your whole mission was there, chant to the poor creature. You are full of compassion for the poor jiva in that slimy body. You did not see the ugly slug that I saw. You saw the soul covered in suffering, forgetful of Krishna. From that moment, my heart opened for all creatures, and I glimpsed the depth of your divine compassion. Now that's one story of Prabhupada and insects, so many stories with insects. We won't go into that, but one is sufficient. If you ever see a slug next time, you should chant to it, um, <laughs> remembering Shiva Prabhupada. So 3913. But the karmis, the pious, oh, the pious activities of the people, such as performance of Vedic rituals, charity, austere penances, and transcendental service, perform with a view to worship you and satisfy you by offering you fruit of results are also beneficial. Such acts of religion never go in vain. So, pious activities are beneficial. They accumulate, and one day these people may become devotees. Gita, Prabhupada says that those who, who are the Sakam devotees, they are magnanimous souls because they're coming to Krishna for it. So verse 3, 9, 14. Let me offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Transcendence who is eternally distinguished by his internal potency. So internal potency, this is one example of how Radharani is hidden in Srimad Bhagavatam. Internal potency. And the word in, in the Sanskrit is rasa. His impersonal feature is realized by intelligence for self-realization. I offer my obeisances unto him who by his pastimes enjoys the creation, maintenance, and dissolution of the cosmic manifestation. So Prabhupada picks up on the word rasa in purport, rasaya. The word rasa is significant. The rasa dance is performed by Lord Krishna the company of coward dancers at Vrindavan. And Garbhadakshai Vishnu is also engaged in rasa enjoyment with his external potency, by which he creates, maintains, and dissolves the entire material manifestation. Indirectly, Lord Brahma offers his respectful obeisances unto Lord Shri Krishna, who is factually ever engaged in rasa enjoyment with the gopis. So it is said that every word, every verse, Krishna is there. And also, you can say that every verse in Bhagavatam, Radharani is there, but here it's more obvious. And by indication of the word rasa, and Prabhupada takes it to the rasa dance. He says, yes, this is what we can expect, uh, this enjoyment. And even Vishnu is enjoying uh, with his uh, jivas when he does the creation. He comes, he enjoys because he comes as incarnations when, when his devotees are in trouble, he likes to be the hero. He comes as a big hero, as Nishigade, as Varaha, as Vamana. He comes as the hero to deliver his devotees. So then he enjoys when he comes in his incarnations. As Matsya, he enjoys in the ocean, in the big waves, and carrying the boat with Satyavata Muni in it. This is how the Lord is enjoying. So we will stop here. You have your homework tomorrow. You should look for the mercy of the Lord in your life. Search for the mercy. Look, and if you expect it, it will come. It's good if you expect mercy. And if you look for it, then you'll find it. So we will finish the verses tomorrow, and we'll find out more analysis of what is the mercy and how to get the mercy tomorrow. So are there any questions or comments on today's verses? Yes? yes um, I'm just asking about the, you could say that uh, sometimes it's so beneficial. Oh, I've heard something Uh, 
Okay. And you heard that if someone falls down too many times, then the mercy is not there. So Prabhupada gave different answers on that question about fall down. That um, one time he said, if you fall down once and twice, you're forgiven. And the third time, then not. Um, another time, there was one devotee who stole some money, and then he left his gun. But Prabhupada called him back. He came back. Prabhupada gave mercy to him. But then again he left. And uh, one of our sannyasis was telling Prabhupada, "No, this is the this is this is it. He's he's really finished now. We, he's out on Juhu Beach, and he's learning. He's putting a coin in one ear. He's learning from a yogi how to go from one ear to the other with the coin. So that's it. We can't take him back." Prabhupada said, "You do not know Nityananda's mercy. It's unlimited." So Prabhupada is ready to take him back. And one time someone asked Prabhupada when he said, okay, three times and you're out. And Prabhupada said, they asked him after the devotee left, is that true, Prabhupada, after three times? And he said, no, I will accept it still. But sometimes devotees, did, I mean, they made a very serious offense. He did curse one devotee not to find a guru or many Brakalpa of Brahma, many millions of births. Because he asked Prabhupada's blessings to go to another guru. So then Prabhupada cursed him. He said, no, no mercy for us. No guru, you will not find guru. And as far as I heard, that devotee is now in materialistic life. He was not a devotee. Okay, any other questions or comments? Jai, all glories to Shri Prabhupada. Tomorrow at 6.30, Finley.